Good evening and welcome to the Penfield Town Board work session of Wednesday, September 28th, 2022. Would everyone please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Thank you so much. I'd just like to note for the record that all board members except Councilperson Ockenden are present this evening. We also have Directors of Developmental Services, Planning and Engineering, our Sustainability Engineer, and our Director of Public Works, as well as our Town Attorney, Pete Weiser, and our Deputy Town Clerk, Sue Scheidt. So thank you very much. We have a very, very special presentation this evening we, uh, for a very special person, and we'd like to begin by um, honoring former Town Supervisor Chan Philbrick. Chan, if you would like to come and please have a seat at the, at the microphone, I guess. It's not really a podium, is it? So speak into the microphone. Is that the <laughs> um, some of you may remember that uh, Chan Philbrick was our town supervisor before Mr. LaFountain, right? So, and Mr. Wiedemer. So, what what were the years? Uh, let's see. Uh, I'm sure if I can remember it. Um, uh, I'll read it to him. Okay. Well, she's going to remind you. <laughs> <laughs> when was it, Linda? No, we have the proclamation to read. Oh, okay. We don't hear it all. Um, and, and I, I left oh, at oh, oh, end of 03, so 10 yes. years uh, mm -hmm. uh, in front of that, so. That's right. Um, and you even have a park named after you, which is pretty impressive. Yes, so I, I'm, I'm humbled every time I drive by that. Uh. As you start this next chapter of your life, um, I know you have big plans to move to Colorado. We did want to honor you with a proclamation. And Linda Cole is going to read it. Yeah, I was honored to, you know, I've, <laughs> I've known you since, I don't know, maybe 84, 85, I know. back in the day. You know, there's a picture the other day that came up on the Penfield History page about the opening of the rec center in 1985, and you were on the front page of the Penfield Messenger Post, you know. And I was there on the Parks and Recreation Board, and yeah, so we go way back. So when Marie asked if I wanted to read the proclamation, I was like, I'd be honored to, of course. So let me, let me read this. Whereas Channing H. Philbrick will be relocating to Colorado after 50 years in Penfield community, and whereas as resident of Penfield since 1969, he became a pillar of the community, much beloved and admired by all. And whereas Channing served on the, as Tem Penfield Town Supervisor from 1994 to 2003, and whereas prior to his service as the Town Supervisor, he enjoyed a 33-year career at Eastman Kodak Company and served as Town Councilman from 1978 to 1985, and whereas during the service to the town, he led with grace and dignity, always putting residents and quality of life first in all that he did. And whereas in 2003, Channing was honored through the renaming of Linear Park to Channing H. Philbrick Park, home to Penfield's Milling Heritage and considered one of the best day hikes in the Rochester area. And whereas in the years following his tenure as town supervisor, Channing continued to serve the Penfield community through volunteer work, and whereas Penfield is fortunate to benefit from Channing's contribution as an exceptional leader, volunteer, and resident, now be it resolved that the Penfield Town Board is proud to celebrate Channing and all that he's done for Penfield, and be it further resolved that the Penfield Town Board extends its sincere gratitude to Channing for his service to Penfield over the years. This is dated September 28, 2002. It's signed by Town Supervisor Marie Sinti, and it lists Debbie Draw, Linda Cole, Candace Lee, and Bob Ockerton as Town Council. So congratulations. Thank you. Time for a couple of words? Or? Absolutely. Okay. Here, here is your Congratulations. Yes, yeah, thank you. <laughs> I usually meet Linda in another place uh, uh, in the evening, but uh, we won't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> Do tell. Every, every time we go into the uh, poorhouse, uh, it seems like we know half the people there. <laughs> and um, uh, 
Well, this is really uh, very special to me and my family. I, my wife is here, and our son David, and uh, uh, his wife Kelly, and, uh, and and our dear friend Dick Horowitz, and uh, Jim Peters, and Mary Lou. Uh, this is really, Penfield has been our home, literally, uh, uh, for the last, I think uh, we counted up 65 or 66 years, depending on how you count. Uh, and I'm pretty fast on counting, so we uh, we come over, I think, to 65. And I, our kids were basically raised here in Penfield schools, and this is this is where it's, where it's at, and a uh, place to uh, work, live, and raise a family, and uh, be sure that you've got some good government. And, uh, and and logical planning and development and so forth. And we've, we've uh, been fortunate in having uh, great uh, elected officials like we have sitting here on the DS that uh, uh, not every community has that and uh, it makes a big difference. I think one of the big surprises that I got uh, was when I came first elected to the town board and I didn't know what it was and uh, so somebody said uh, one meeting a month or something like that <laughs> and uh, but I, I I quickly learned that the, the, the town board doesn't really run the town it's the staff that they uh, attract and train and develop, and they're the ones who really <clears throat> make things work. And uh, uh, my impression of government employees at that time uh, wasn't very high. And uh, but I, I quickly learned that uh, people are people, and uh, they have skills. They they like to get things done. They like to make things happen. Make things better. And. Uh, it, uh, uh, I think uh, if I did anything with working with the town staff and the, and the board was to, to help focus on some of the issues and help people uh, rally around the uh, things that really need needed to be done, extending sewer districts and uh, water districts and uh, uh, parks. So the open space program was a, a big winner, uh, and uh, hopefully the, the board is continuing uh, con considering to continue with open space purchase. But uh, but it's it's the, the people uh, who are. Just, in the town hall, in the highway garage, uh, uh, who make make this uh, stuff happen. But they have to have leadership, and they have to have support from the leaders. Because as we all know, you, sometimes you get some difficult decisions uh, that you are uh, faced with, and particularly this, this time of the year, election time, uh, uh, sometimes any logic as to what people want done is, is lacking at, at best. So uh, I've been pleasantly surprised over the years with uh, the, uh, uh, the ability to uh, attract and keep uh, quality staff uh, at the town hall. And I think we've all benefited from that. And I'm sure we'll with Marie's leadership and the rest of the board. And uh, uh, so um, I, I, we leave sadly, uh, but we've got to listen to our advisors and doctors and, uh, and our kids <laughs> who, uh, if we didn't go, they were going to find ways of uh, uh, making it happen. So we didn't want to test that, uh, that bit. So, uh, so it's, uh, I'm uh, uh, happy to call you all friends and uh, I'm proud to tell people I, I'm from Penfield, New York and uh, it's a great place to live, work and uh, raise a family and, uh, uh, and with that I'm going to fade away and let you get on to some more important business. But thank you again for all this. Uh. Chan, we wish you and Marie the very best in your move. Um, I know that what you've given to this community is priceless. It's beyond measure. Um, I still walk around, this, and there's still town staff, that obviously, that remember you and worked for you, and to a person, always say what a wonderful leader and manager you were, and you made such an effort to get to know them and lead with hospitality and service. So mm -hmm. for that, we really appreciate well, that. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for the comments, and uh, thank you for for, for doing this, and uh, we will, uh, we uh, 
have our family around the country trying to stream getting in. I hope, hope uh, uh, they've been able to get this thing. I always get in later, I guess, and see if we didn't get it uh, the first time around. So, again, thank you all, and um, we will uh, go on with life and uh, and have some fun. Thank keep you. in con keep in contact, Jan. You can still watch us on TV and call in, call in <laughs> from time to time. That's right. You're on Facebook, so you should be able to get in and watch on Facebook, yeah. right? I'm uh, actually usually on uh, uh, legislative <coughs> session nights. I usually grab my uh, iPad, sit in a comfortable chair with it in my lap, and uh, really? stream, stream cool. the uh, work <laughs> session. Uh, and, uh, and, that's uh, that's all I remember. Because most of the time I'm dozing off. <laughs> <laughs> we won't take offense at that. No. Okay. Again, thank you all. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Chan. I'd like to move on to our approval of minutes from the last work session of September 14th. So moved. Um, I'll give it to Councilperson Cole as a motion and Councilperson Draw as a second. Are there any questions or comments about the minutes? Okay. We'll roll call vote, please. Sinti. Aye. Draw. Aye. Cole. Aye. Lee. Aye. Four ayes. Thank you. Uh, Monthly reports are due at the beginning of the month, not the end of the month, so we can move right into our guests for the evening. We do have one guest, Fred Reynaldi from Parkside Commons, and Miss Mr. Valentine, I believe you are teeing this up for us. Yes, so we've got uh, Fred is on Zoom um, with us. Uh, he's unable to be here this evening, um, but uh, through his office, uh, they reached out. Um, he's the owner of Parkside Commons, so as you know, on the west side of 250, uh, backing up to Harris Whalen Park, um, and he recently reached out through his office, and they're interested in, in making a connection between uh, Parkside Commons and Harris Whalen Park. And since Harris Whalen Park is town-owned property, uh, that's why it's before the board this evening. Um, I can let Fred share a little bit more about the where and the what, um, but just thought uh, it'd best to have him uh, come in and explain his thoughts and get the board's reaction to that. So with that, Fred, we'll let you jump in. Awesome. Mark, thank you. And uh, everyone, I, I appreciate uh, the time this evening. I'm sorry that I'm not in person. Um, I'm actually in uh, northern Vermont uh, working on a new project uh, that, um, that had a little some time sensitivities, but I did not want to miss uh, this opportunity as we are very excited uh, to be uh, entering a whole new host of, uh, of additional tenants and uh, additional improvements to the project. And as part of that, I wanted to see what the town's um, feeling would be in uh, connecting and creating a, uh, a more uh, interactive uh, relationship to the wonderful park that is our neighbor uh, to the west of Parkside Commons. Uh, the uh, large majority of the new uh, additions to the campus, uh, including the new Starbucks, are uh, culture-driven, dynamic uh, uh, businesses that are going to allow uh, for an awesome kind of new uh, breath of, of life and, and evolution of, of the project. And, and we thought uh, that the park uh, is both uh, a resource and an opportunity to continue uh, to enjoy uh, the uh, that that trade area that uh, that has been, um, you know, really uh, showing its strength and purpose within within the community, which we're very proud of to, to play a small role in. Uh, this is something where uh, I would, um, subject to the town's interest, uh, like you've seen from me in the past, I would uh, subsequent to this meeting uh, bring in uh, plans and, and renderings and and suggested materials and locations, but uh, before uh, I did so, I wanted to, to be sure that this, this would be something uh, that would uh, potentially be considered. Mr. Rinaldi, where exactly would this be located and what are you envisioning on a high level? So the, uh, the former medical building, which is located at the northwest portion of the project, so that would be just adjacent uh, mm -hmm. to the Starbucks or behind the Babylon. Mm -hmm. Okay. We, we will be in front of uh, the town very soon. 
with uh, really uh, spectacular plans for a, um, a reprogram to that building where it, it, would, uh, it would move in a direction of, of retail and specialty retail uh, and include a complete rehab of the building, which would come with uh, several amenities in and outside of it that would lend itself uh, really well to uh, driving visibility and being an awesome transition point to the um, to the project, not not just our project for that matter. I mean, the the hope would be uh, that this would provide access, kind of very much like the intention of the LUAMP, where you have these internal circulation points. Uh, this one would just be focused on pedestrian foot traffic, um, uh, potentially bicycles. But uh, but the hope would be to create a illuminated, safe pathway between the north the northwest portion of Parkside Commons and, uh, and Harris Women Park. The bridge, <clears throat> the uh, you know, final materials would be subject to collaboration between uh, my, my team and, and, and yours, uh, but it would be a, a, a double wide uh, transfer bridge uh, that would be aesthetically pleasing and uh, in year round, year round functional. I know that that is a uh, coveted sledding hill in the winter and, uh, and has a whole host of awesome uses throughout the, uh, the spring, uh, summer, and fall. So uh, we envision a year-round um, bridge, a, a double wide to allow uh, 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 traffic both ways on foot and or bike, and, um, and something that would be uh, uh, you know, built through collaboration and design with our, both of our teams. Um, I imagine that you get a number of people walking through there anyway right now. We have a couple scenarios to play out. Uh, one includes uh, tr foot traffic pushing towards the southern part of the park in our project, where they would uh, where they would uh, can enter the project towards the AAA building. Um, my hope was to make the connection a little more intuitive and a little more fun, and kind of pull the foot traffic through. The heart of um, of the project and the neighbor and, the, and our neighbors to the north, and also uh, use this as an opportunity to to improve our pedestrian uh, circulation. So right now, it's it is common that though, uh, if you remember several years back, uh, that span of trees mm -hmm. were were removed um, from mm -hmm. from from the park, mm -hmm. opening up a really cool. Um, Kind of circulation and visibility between the neighboring uh, properties. This would be this would be a little more guided um, and and bring you through uh, the heart of uh, of the uh, the businesses that that exist at the uh, the northwest corner of the intersection. Um, and then if uh, those who don't use that unencumbered pathway will will in fact kind of traverse through through the woods. You'll see that often. On the Fourth of July, with the fireworks and, and things like that, it's a little easier in the winter when the uh, some of the leaf cover is is cleared. Um, but it, we, we'd like it to be a kind of a a easier, inviting, safe, uh, like I said, illuminated uh, uh, pathway that that allows for kind of a natural uh, enjoyment of the same. Um, you know, there's when. There's a visible connection that leaves a little stronger of a, of a memory or a call to action, and you know, in our mind, this is less of a this is less of a business amenity and more of a community amenity as we go to great lengths to improve the aesthetics of our campus, the strength of tenancy within our campus, and every time you add a feature like this that is that is both shared um, and has the ability to be used beyond um, any any form of business uh, capacity. You know, those are all things that help uh, the storytelling, um, the you know the quality of life for both the community and the tenants, and, and encourage uh, tenants to uh, you know to commit and take leaps of faith uh, because they know that <clears throat> that there's offerings that allow for you know an advance enjoyment of the property and, and, and their business. And as we all work very hard to make all the above um, 
you know, important parts and productive parts of our lives, when, when we add little things like this, it just, it's, it's notice and it builds empathy in the community. And uh, it is something that we would like to celebrate by uh, adding, uh, like I said, okay. additional pedestrian can features. I, can I ask uh, just a couple of questions? I want to make sure that the board has time to ask questions too. Are you looking yes. to maintain this yourself? Yeah, so we would uh, very much, uh, this would be uh, common to, uh, uh, to easements that, you, that we have in place with the town where uh, the maintenance uh, would, be, uh, would, would be borne by, uh, by, park, by Parkside, correct? Okay. Are there any questions by the town board members? Not, not questions. I just, um, I don't know, I have problems with this because it seems like it's jumping ahead. I would rather hear about what's going to be there, you know, that's the, so enticing that you'd want to open up to the park, but at the same time, the park is separate. It's the community park, and, and we have those trees for a reason. It separates the business community from the uh, recreational community where children are playing and so on like that. And so that'd be, a, in my mind, it's a big step to even consider this kind of uh, change. Right now, you have that little walkway <coughs> behind like where Downs is at uh, Fourth of July, people will go through there, but it, it's not like a, something that is, you want people to go through, you don't, you're not expecting people like that's another access to the park. Um, that's just a little cut through for, for a special time of year. I, I don't know if we want to have an area that's open all the time to get that, um, biz, that uh, business district joined to a, uh, a town park. So, so I think, I mean, I just, uh, I don't have a question to it, except maybe that, could this be talked about maybe later after you have your discussion about what you want to do in the old medical building? Because I think sure. right well, now uh, it's well, so, man, too uh, soon. Not to cut you off, but uh, consistent Fine. with my initial statement, the, the reason that I don't have renderings or anything presumptuous was uh, for that exact reason. Um, my if uh, an example, a scenario that could play out uh, would, would include the following. If the town was amenable to this concept, the, f the finished design, configuration, orientation of entrances, and tenant mix would be impacted by this. And that could create a really awesome thing where you have a building that really has no back of house or no rear. rear. It's, a, it's a, uh, a building that has active four sides and projects to the park and and is amenity to the community. There are many, many, many examples. In fact, this is something that is more common now and desired now than has been in the past, uh, where municipal features, government features, private lands, public parks are interacting with, complementing, and supporting business, park, and other, and other features. Hiking trails, biking trails, is serpentine, allowing people to access things easily a concept that a community member has to kind of navigate a forest to enjoy amenities on either side, that's not a desirable feature. A celebrated, well-designed element that allows for safe transfer is, though. And my proposal doesn't include removing swaths of trees. And we didn't, we didn't uh, with my example on the, the uh, southwest corner, that wasn't something that we were the arbiter of. We didn't we, we didn't uh, remove mm -hmm. those those trees. You know th this is something that would be designed both uh, with the environment in mind, with aesthetics and safety in mind, and the health and wellness of both neighboring parcels. No, we certainly don't want to reduce the uh, or, or challenge the integrity of the park. This this in my mind would be an amenity an amenity to that. And uh, my thought is an example. A family that has a ball game going on where there's uh, intermission or break and they want to walk over and grab a, uh, a coffee or a snack from uh, Starbucks or any of the businesses and, and walk back over. It's that to me, as a parent, that would be an awesome thing. Mr. So Rinaldi, certainly not. Yeah. Uh, I just want to <coughs> interrupt you there for a second. Did you have a question, Ms. Draw? I did. So, Mr. Rinaldi, I had a question for you. So, I, I understand what you're talking about with, or proposing with that the, the walkway. Are you at all going to be looking at the configuration of that, the parking lot and so forth? Of how I, I, I for one, am in that parking lot 
quite a bit, and it's, um, there's a lot of new business in there, as you said, the Starbucks. It's a, it's a pretty busy parking lot. It's a, right now, I was wondering, if, you know, as far as making it more walkable, or are you looking at, at ways that you're going, are you gonna be looking at that parking, the parking configuration in there at all? Yes, so when I, uh, when I had mentioned that the, this would be part of a, uh, a, a increase in the pedestrian uh, navigation throughout the campus, that, that's what I meant. So if there were a pathway that provided access to the, to the project, the every expectation of circulation on foot and the safety thereof that of, of that community member that that would be paramount. That would be that would be the first part of this design is is how to use benefit and keep safe uh, traffic through there. The northwest corner of the parse of the project uh, that that building has largely been vacant for uh, for several years now. There's very little if no traffic that that navigates that that portion. This design would take in consideration all of the above. Safety is paramount, design would follow, and it would be a collaborative effort between our team and, and yours. Where are you thinking that this would be located? The, the study, what we would do is we would study, there's a creek, there's, some, there's a little waterway there. We would, we would identify the location of least impact. Um, and uh, and so that would and then uh, obviously there we wouldn't want to disturb any mature trees or anything that uh, that we would very much like to preserve and save. So so there's a lot of there, there's a lot of of, uh, of study that's required to kind of get to a, a formal um, presentation. Uh, before I I went uh, through those studies, I just wanted to uh, to see if, if the town uh, would be excited to. Uh, to see a feature and amenity like this introduced that would be a partnership between uh, private and, and public lands. Okay, uh, any other questions from the board members? All right, um, I'm not sure if the board would like some time to consider it. I think we have to. Um, this is just thrown right out at us. We okay, need some all right. Time. Um, so I think what we'll do is we're going to table this for a future discussion at the next work session, which will be October 12th. Um, is that okay, Ms. Ivers, to, or sorry, Mr. Valentine, you're in charge of that one. Um, is there anything else that we could even see, some sort of, um, I mean, even a general idea of where that might be located, I a mean, picture of something somewhere else? Yeah, I mean, I can work with Mr. Rinaldi between now and the next meeting if he has some other locations that he has in mind not spending a lot of money and say, hey, this is something he's seen at other locations or something he has, you know, in one of his other areas to say this is something similar we're thinking about. And then we can, you know, simple enough sketch something on an aerial photo and just say here's kind of the potential location and here's how it would tie in and um, yeah, get some I materials mean, for the board to at least kind of look at before, you know, he spends, you know, any money, at least some photos or at least some thought. Sure, I'm sensitive to the fact that, you know, you don't want to invest too much before you go down a certain road, but um, I do think given, it helps me to just sort of visualize it, um, but I do think I am hearing from the other board members, they need some soak time. Yeah. Well, you know, also, uh, it's the impact to the park, and no matter what, I mean, <laughs> So even if it's not a formal proposal, it'd still be nice to have some sort of uh, feedback from you or the PRC about Yeah, this was just thoughts with the obviously trees. an initial conversation and obviously mm -hmm. as we got into design, that would be something, you know, we would review an engineering work with, you know, DPW and the parks uh, group to look at how that is. I think he's just looking to see this is something that the board would consider. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously then, you know, as he shared, we'd have to get into design and look at how this would work and, you know, how that, you know, further ties in. So we can come up with some initial stuff or work with. Mm -hmm. Okay, with, before uh, we table this, um, Mr. Weissart, is there anything that we need to be aware of from a legal aspect? Uh, I don't think so. Um, okay. I'm not sure. I think it's hard on this map to see how far his property goes and where the park begins. Because yeah. my recollection is there is some land bank parking. So I think that some of that green space might be part of the uh, Parkside Commons property. But I don't think that, other than that, I don't think there is. Okay, nothing glaring then. No. 
Okay. All right. So then we will table this item for further discussion on October 12th. Okay? Incredible. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. You as well. All right. We'll move on to our action items, starting with action item A, Clark House design proposal, Mr. Tate. Thank you. Um, so over the past year, uh, we've been, the town has been working with uh, Bergman to kind of look at the, the Clark House itself, the existing condition, uh, you know, the feasibility of, you know, either rehabbing and reusing that building or what that, you know, could potentially look like. Um, about a month and a half ago, I was here uh, before the board to discuss kind of what's been done so far um, and what Bergman has prepared for um, us. With that said, the, the request by the board at the time was to kind of reach back out to Bergman uh, with a little bit different direction to come up with some additional kind of additional scope of work above and beyond what they were originally hired to do. Um, with that, they were asked to, and, and they've put together a proposal that I've, um, you know, have and have shared with the board to look at the feasibility, the constructability, and a cost analysis for two additional options. Uh, so they've labeled them 5A and 5B as it is a, a similar continuation of what's been done thus far. Um, but again, slightly different than looking at the overall building kind of as it sits with the idea that 5A would um, kind of take the original and the historic portion of the building from 19 or 1832 rather, keeping that and rehabbing that portion of the building, but uh, taking down the 1939 and uh, 1983 addition uh, which is kind of currently the, the bar area, the kitchen, and the pro shop, with the idea that in place of those two portions that are demolished, to add some type of new kind of gathering room addition with the intent it could be you know used for a town lodge or other town uses. The option 5B that they've come up with is, you know, if the building is, and kind of as we look at this and the option, or the ability to put an addition onto kind of that original um, homestead portion. If that's not feasible um, or, you know, depending on the cost, if the entire building needed to be taken down, uh, what it would look like to build a replica of the current house and what's there uh, with that same um, additional kind of gathering room space on the back. Okay, so basically, the last time we talked about this in work session, we asked, um, look, we think we want to try to save this piece and let's see if we can use it for a gathering space. So this is you coming back to us with, here's how much it would be to look at that option, right? Correct. Okay. You know, so, so based on the kind of the, the two options that they're going to be or you know, have proposed to look at. You know, the cost for that, uh, they have estimated it, it would be a cost not to exceed $20,000. Not to say that it would necessarily take the, the full amount if they're able to do it quicker, you know, and, and easier given their kind of background in history and knowledge of the building already. You know, the, the price may end up being lower, um, but that's at least kind of a baseline of what that would, what that would take to come up with uh, kind of these options, a conceptual uh, plan for what the uh, floor plan, you know, could and would look like, um, as well as cost estimates for what they envision that, you know, requiring. Okay. Um, what is the timeline? How long would they, do they think this would take? Um, so it would be roughly two months, give or take. Um, again, with Within their proposal, they did give it in a, an original anticipated schedule, and I apologize when, kind of timing-wise, when this was sent to me, um, I was not able to make it um, at the last work session uh, nor present, so their timeline has been pushed back slightly. Um, but again, they're looking at you know just over two months, or had originally at least proposed that knowing that we've got holidays coming up between kind of Thanksgiving and even approaching, you know, kind of Christmas um, into December. I would think that that may get stretched a little bit longer uh, just due to the pushback, but I would hope that this could still, I could still come back to the board um, in December uh, kind of with their report. 
Any questions from the board? Uh, to be clear, to, just to be clear, sure. um, is it just the exterior portion of the Clark House that they're looking at, you know, like the foundation and the roof and this and that, or, uh, so or are they looking inside to see if it's feasible to keep the upstairs both. with that staircase that exists and to um, use it? It'd be inside and out, you know, especially looking at having to, needing to, or, you know, as they're proposing to incorporate kind of demolition of essentially two thirds of the building, they would need to look at both inside and out and how that could be accomplished. Now, the, not to say that what they're coming up with is, are gonna be full blown engineered plans that we could go out for bid and, and utilize if we like one option and that's what we wanna go with. You know, there would be additional engineering that would be required to do that, um, but they're at least trying to, to come up with kind of a, a conceptual plan of what that might look like. Okay. Further questions? Can you remind me uh, as to what the concept we had for the gathering space? Because it's built into their um, design and assessment study. And so I don't know if we've already laid out options for them. So some of the, the options, again, you know, it, it could be changed a little bit. And, and part of their proposal does include a kickoff meeting to finalize kind of what the town's looking at. Um, my understanding is, and again, kind of coming up with a thought, you know, that this could be used as and become a new town lodge um, or other type gathering space, it would incorporate, you know, a kitchen uh, that could be used in that lodge, as well as interior accessible bathrooms, a larger open area that could have tables and chairs and um, exterior accessible bathrooms for any other patrons uh, that are kind of hiking, utilizing the, the property, um, you know, for any, whatever reason. So they're looking at the um, feasibility of just uh, just those structures, it sounds like, if we decide to rehab and or replica. Correct. Okay. okay. So there's no other designs being proposed as part of their study? Uh, no. Okay. No, at our last work session, we talked about um, definitely wanting to try to preserve the structure, the original structure, and then uh, the pleasure of the board at that point, and it could always change, is looking to see if we could somehow use it for the town, uh, town purposes, because we do need, we are in need of gathering space, we're in need of lodge space, um, something that could hold events. So that was where we left it. <coughs> I'm good with it. I think this is the next um, step. Yes. We have to do this, you know, proceed ahead, and this is, um, I think, it's a, a well a well use of the. I, I, we have to spend this money, but we're going to get, you know, we're going to know what's what's what when the end, you know. Yep, I think from a town need, you know, as you know, re in, indicated, we certainly have the need for you know more town lodges. We have the need for more just town general space. Um, you know, so I think this would be a, a step in the right direction to to come up with, you know, what right. I guess a good use for what's mm -hmm. currently there. Right. And, it, and, you know, as was noted at that last meeting, the Historic Preservation Board looked at the plans and, and also suggested that as long as we maintain the 1832 building, they're happy. You know, the other part doesn't have the historic significance mm -hmm. that the 1832 portion does. So even from that, that level, this is something that uh, kind of prompts this further investigation mm -hmm. of what can be done. Well, the only other thing I would say, though, is that um, you know, Bergman has helped us so far with last year, I guess the town board also had, you know, <coughs> them examine some things and given the fact that they have been in this building, are familiar with it, mm -hmm. have all sorts of data, I would hope that they could really keep the cost down and turn this around fairly quickly. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that, you know, it, if I were to reach out to any other number of engineering firms to ask them to do the same, their price would be significantly higher than what Bergman's proposed. And, and again, Bergman's able to accomplish that because of their you know, prior knowledge and what's been done thus far. So you feel that the price is reasonable? Yes. Okay. All right. I don't expect the reimbursables to be very high, but can you just give me a ballpark? Uh, so within their, again, within their 
uh, proposal, they indicated that they anticipate the reimbursables to be, you know, approximately $100, um, and that would cover, you know, any printing, copying, if we needed, you know, kind of larger, larger plans, um, or, you know, I guess a, a poster size of the, you know, the conceptual floor plan and layout. Well, um, so it, it also in, says there that like the agency fees and they, they list quite a few are excluded from that. And so I, I, again, I'm not expecting it to be much since they stated the de minimis a hundred, but I just want to sure. make and, sure like in your experience yep. that it's so, not going to add another 10 K. No. So I can say the, I, I think that the language within that portion of the proposal is kind of their standard template. Uh, with what's been done so far okay. in the original proposal from them, I, I think there was less than less than a thousand dollars in reimbursable expenses, and that was over the course of you know, the past year and multiple kind of different renditions and options um, above and beyond what well more than what they're proposing right now. Okay. All right, so if everyone is comfortable, are you looking for us to enter into this agreement? Uh, so I'd be looking for a motion or, or I guess a request for me to formalize a resolution uh, to go before the board at the next meeting to you know, authorize the town supervisor to sign this uh, proposal and contract with them. And one more quick question. Yes. Um, Mr. Weiser, have you reviewed this? Yes, I reviewed it earlier today and I, I, I find it to be satisfactory. Okay. I'll make that motion. I'll, All right. I'll second that. I have a motion by Councilperson Lee and a second by Councilperson Draw to prepare a resolution authorizing the supervisor to sign the agreement for Shadow Pines. Mm -hmm. Or Clark, Clark House Design Clark proposal House design. at Shadow Pines. All right. Thank you. All right. Any questions? Okay. Roll call vote. Cinti. Aye. <clears throat> Draw. Aye. Call. Aye. Lee. Aye. Four eyes. Thank you very much. Moving on to our community choice aggregation update with our sustainability engineer, Sarah Waterman. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. Um, we have two people attending from Good Energy by Zoom. That is Jeff Faith and Javier, please correct me if I'm wrong, Javier Barrios. Great. <laughs> um, they are representatives from Good Energy, the town's administrator for the CCA program, the Community Choice Aggregation Program. Um, this program is something that we entered into at the end of last year, um, which was approved by the previous town board. Um, a community choice aggregation program is regulated by the state of New York's Department of Public Service and the previous town board chose to move forward with this program because there was a desire to provide an opportunity for residents to have more green energy at a cost close to the RG&E variable rate over the past 12 months at that time, as well as to provide a fixed rate option for the residents for their electricity supply. This program does not affect the delivery rates for electricity, nor anything on the RG&E bill for gas. It is only the electricity supply. Um, there has been some confusion lately for some residents that have called into the town and commented online about the price of their energy, as well as um, reading bills and reviewing those items. Um, I did want to address that tonight as well. Um, that confusion comes because there is a line item now on people's bills with, from RG&E that are part of the CCA program that says Constellation New Energy Charges. Those charges are specific to the electricity supply and that rate, as well as the kilowatt hours that are used, which is the energy used. Um, that charge line replaces RG&E's electricity supply line. So it's not being double charged. It's not in addition to, it is a replacement. Um, and I just wanted to make sure that that's clear. 
Um, tonight, Javier, Jeff, and I will be presenting some information on the program and what has happened over the last 10 months within the program. And I'd love to start with a graph that actually shows the um, supply rate from RG&E compared to the Penfield Green rate. Uh, okay. Um, so this graph shows in green the Penfield Green rate, which is the base rate for the CCA accounts, um, compared to the blue chart part of the chart that shows the prior 30 days rate. So that is 5.733 cents per kilowatt hour compared to 7.780 cents per kilowatt hour. If we look at the middle bar, that shows the three month prior average of what RG&E's variable rate was, and that's 6.7 cents per kilowatt hour. When we're looking historically back at the past 10 months, which we'll also look at a graph for, um, it, we can see that there has been an estimated savings of $50 per resident over that 10 month period, which equates to approximately 400,000 across the town's accounts that are enrolled in the program at this time. To be clear, this is an opt-out program. That is the way that the state regulates it, and it has to be opt-out rather than opt-in. And that is why the town moved forward with that type of program. Um, the residents can opt in or out of the program at any time with no additional fee. There's just a 15 to 30 day time period for that changeover. Um, and at this point, I will pass it to Javier to review the t graph on program rate versus rg &E price to compare. No, you're right. Okay, I'm putting it back up, sorry. <laughs> I'm not doing a good job. Javier, can you see that graph? I don't, we, uh, Jeff, do you see that? I don't see the graph, but I have it in front of me. Great. Uh, it's the Jan 22 graph to August 22, correct? Correct. Right, so um, if we see, um, certainly it's a telling story with regard to um, what the program does and what the value is. Obviously the straight green line uh, shows a, that we have a budget secure price. Uh, uh, we call it a hedge, right? you're hedging uh, against the volatility. So we really see the value of the hedge here, especially with the, with the volatile times that we're seeing in the markets. Um, the unique thing about New York is that New York is a tariff rate that fluctuates every month. So you have, you're going to have a new price every single month, and it resets itself. So as you can see, the ebbs and flows of the price to compare, which is the red line. Um, and there's a lot of factors that go into um, the movements of the graph, um, or the movements of that price to compare, being that it fluctuates every month. Um, supply and demand, uh, weather. Um, there's a fundamental effect and there's a speculative effect, meaning that things, for example, geopolitical news can really affect it. Uh, we've seen the crisis in Europe um, make the US domestic market be very sympathetic um, to energy movements. Uh, so we've seen a lot of volatility with that. So I think really um, what we've seen is um, that markets uh, over the last 10 months have, have been extremely fluid um, and, and really it's, it's uh, energy supply storages are, are quite low uh, with regard to natural gas and natural gas is a, a primary driver of electric generation. So don't want to get into too much of the technical information. The graph speaks for itself um, and um, you know we see that we've had ebbs and flows throughout the, the 10 months and that uh, you know we see in June we had a, uh, a resetting of the tariffs. Uh, there's several components within that, um, and in, in those graphs, uh, you know, there's different adjustments. Mm -hmm. So you're going to see mm -hmm. that, that moving. Well, he's still on it. Okay, I guess in this next graph. Oh, okay. Um, Never mind. Thank you, Tara. If you'd like to, um, I can introduce it, and then maybe you can go into details. Sure. Great. So this graph shows the carbon offsets each month based on the Penfield program. Um, this is kind of to take the greenhouse gas emissions that are being saved, essentially, and putting them into a more understandable value um, for me as well as everyone else. Um, and Javier, could you go into that, please? 
Sure. So uh, one of the things that we like to do is really simplify the understanding of what a carbon offset is. In, in many respects, a carbon offset is um, carbon dioxide um, uh, in the, the unit of measure of metric tons. But that really doesn't mean a lot to, to, to a lot of people. You know, what, what is a metric ton of, of uh, carbon uh, dioxide that's been taken out of, out of the earth? You know, essentially, you bought a renewable energy certificate that, that's tied to a renewable uh, project, uh, specifically in this case, a hydro project. So that hydro, hydro project has been built. Uh, your uh, investment in that project through a CCA program has created these particular offsets. So um, um, we've, instead of just talking about the actual tonnage or the, uh, the, the greenhouse gas uh, in pounds or in tonnage, we've uh, equated it to what it means um, uh, in a, a regular cor course of a year. For example, uh, how many passenger vehicles have been taken off for that uh, year? Um, that's in the, the blue bar there in the graph. Um, what the total of garbage trucks uh, that were, um, t uh, that, that took away a uh, waste um, um, the total in, in that year, as well as the annual usage. Obviously, that's a little bit more easy to understand. Um, and there's plenty of other, uh, uh, you know, measures. I think that, you know, looking at the program, um, if you wanted to know what the actual metric tons uh, equivalent of what the usage is within Penfield, it's about 25,000 metric tons of greenhouse gas emissions uh, that were removed. And that's removed instantly because that hydro plant is, is up and running. So, uh, you know, um, we're excited that we ran, ran the program with Penfield. Uh, kudos to, to the board, uh, to uh, Penfield Green and, and everybody involved for really uh, pushing. And this is a 50% offset uh, on your total electrical load that we're serving. So um, any, anything else you want to add uh, to that? But that's pretty much the, the summary of this particular graph. If you have any questions, let me know. All right, is there anything uh, else you want to present before I open it up to questions from the board? Um, I've already addressed this one, okay, so thank you. Um, so overall, um, at this time, there's not any expected changes in the program. Um, at some point, obviously, we the town board will have to make a decision if they would like to continue a program or stop a, the program and not restart it. The program as it is ends in at the end of December 2023. At this time, there's again, no expectation for the board to take any action in regards to this. This is kind of just an update on how the program is going and how it affects the residents um, and the, the benefits that have come so far. Um, I will also mention the previous town board did choose to offer a 100% green option. Mm -hmm. um, and that is at a rate of 6.733 cents per kilowatt hour, which is higher than the base rate, um, but still actually close to what the 30 month and the 30 day, I mean, sorry, the three month and the 30 day look back for our g &E's pricing is um, in the future. So likely after the beginning of the year is when it may be appropriate for the board to start considering how they feel about the program as it is and the approach with good energy and staff of do we want to continue a CCA program and what are we looking for if we are going to. Any questions from board members? I just had a question. Sarah, I can't remember how many residents of Penfield are in the program now? Sure. Or households, I should say? Yep, so it's, it's rg &E accounts, so households is correct. Mm -hmm. um, approximately 8,200 are enrolled right now. The approximate total accounts within Penfield is 13,000. So about 62% of residents are enrolled in the program. I do not have off the top of my head the number that are opted up to the 100% green, but if you would like that, we can provide that to you. Oh, that's okay. No, that's perfect. Thank you. More questions? I thought this was as good as an update. Can you get that up on the website? 
I mean, that's, that get the people to see it. that they're, made, they're it, yeah. it's working well Abs for them. That, yeah. Absolutely. So at this time, the um, price comparison graph is actually on the PenfieldCCA.com website, and Good Energy updates that every month okay. so that residents can consistently be aware of what the price to compare is. Yeah. And so they can make continue to make the choice for themselves if they would like to stay in the program or opt out. Um, we actually wanted to present this information to you as the board before we put it on the Penfield CCA website or the Penfield Town website, yeah. Yeah. Um, but that is ne a next step. Okay. Very good. And then the other thing we're trying to get up on the website is a mock bill, yep. RGE bill with balanced billing, RGE bill without balanced billing. But just to explain to residents, here's how you read your bill. This is what uh, number is calculated and how. Right. Because we're still getting calls about how do I understand my, my yeah. RGE bill? Is this really saving money? Yep, absolutely. Okay. Great. Any other questions for Sarah? Thank you. Good update. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, very much. Thank you. Thank you, Javier. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, Supervisor. Thank you, Board Sarah, for having us. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank Take you. care. Take care. And uh, Sarah, you're still in the hot seat. Um, you're going to give an update to the town board about clean energy communities and what they are. Correct. Um, so. I'm going to actually do kind of an overview of two different options that the town has. One is clean energy communities and one is climate smart communities. Just because both of those acronyms are thrown around a whole lot and I think it would be beneficial for the town board as well as the public to understand the difference. Um, so I'll start with clean energy communities because that's our, our hot topic. Um, Within clean energy communities, there are 14 high impact action items that municipalities can pursue. Um, one of those options is only for counties, so that narrows it down to 13. Um, those high impact action items are items to help municipalities pursue clean energy and sustainability with the climate. Um, comparing that to climate smart communities, Climate smart communities have 115 different action items that can be taken, and that ranges from technical or um, energy type projects all the way to education and socioeconomic projects. Um, climate smart communities, it is a requirement to re-up every five years and have a continued effort to stay designated as a climate smart community. Clean energy communities does not have that. Clean energy communities, there's only a requirement to complete four action items to be designated as a clean energy community. The town, well, the Energy and Environmental Advisory Committee over the past six years has been considering both of these uh, designations um, and previously have chosen to pursue action items that are part of clean energy communities. This was a choice that was made because those are action items that the town had already actually started pursuing and have been continuing to pursue as different sustainable efforts because the town boards have wanted to have a more sustainable and healthy town. They, the town board previously did not pursue these specifically because of these designations. They pursued them because they want a healthy and sustainable town. This is an opportunity that if the town board so chooses, they can have the town staff and have the EEA seek continue pursuing it, pursuing the actual designation and not only the action items. At this time, we have completed as a town two action items and received credit for them, as well as one action grant for $5,000 to install a charging station at the town hall, in addition to the one that's already there. We are in process of pursuing one more high action <coughs> impact, <coughs> high impact yeah, action yeah. item <laughs> um, to also receive another action grant for $5,000 to put towards a sustainable effort in the town. Um, 
So basically what you're talking about is, first of all, just alerting the town board that we've been pursuing these um, clean energy community action items and is it the town board's will to just continue doing that silently or do we want to have an official designation? Absolutely. Okay. What are the pros and cons of either of those? Sure. So um, I'll start with the pros. The biggest benefit of pursuing the designation <clears throat> is that that allows an opportunity for, for grant funding for the town for more sustainable efforts. Um, those can range from updating the town facilities to have heat pumps or a geothermal system, car charging stations, putting another solar field in, in town, similar different okay. sustainable efforts. Those grants are as a designation grant, which can be up to $5,000, or a point-based grant, in addition to these action grants we've already pursued, for up to $70,000 as the size of the town is right now. Um, so that is a large potential benefit for the town. There are a limited number of these grants, but there are still a fair bit of those that are open right now and available. Um, it's a first come, first serve type grant. Um, another benefit is the town would continue leading by example for other towns by pursuing this, by pursuing he a healthy and sustainable community, by completing these different action items, then they're showing other towns that this is the way mm -hmm. to go forward. The town can choose to do that without getting a formal designation. Mm -hmm. That's what the town has been doing. So that, that can be a pro or an, a con. It depends how you look at it. The biggest con that's kind of out there for clean energy communities is that there's a continuing cost. At this point, the town board has chosen to move forward with a sustainability <coughs> engineer to continue pursuing these types of efforts, <coughs> but that's not the only cost to the town. And these grants do not, do not cover the entirety of the sustainable efforts that the town can pursue. And obviously that money has to come from somewhere and has to be in the budget, and that's taxpayer money. So that's a potential negative of there's a cost to things that we do, both in time and finances. Okay. So thoughts, questions from board members? I, I think it's good to try to do climate smart community, to try to do any of those things that are um, have a checklist of opportunities, because whether we pursue a grant or not, it, it shows that we're working towards these goals and that there is the opportunity if we should, um, so desire to um, put the money up to like a 50-50 match or whatever they're asking. I, I don't see that that's a negative unless it's taking too much time on your schedule that you would be doing something else. I mean, is that is that something that would be an impact? Everything that the town chooses to move forward with in the sustainable direction is an impact, but it's do that doesn't mean that there's not enough staff, I mean, that's part of why a sustainability engineer was included right, right. in the budget. Um, the biggest consideration is, I think, balancing what efforts the town wants to pursue, because obviously staffing is what it is, and whatever is most important is most important. Right. Um, the biggest thing to consider with all of this is the, ve the very big difference between clean energy communities and climate okay. smart communities, yeah. because climate smart communities, there is a continuing required effort to stay designated. And clean energy communities, there is not. You can be participating as we are now, but once you're designated, you will always be designated. For climate smart communities, that is not the case. There is a long-term commitment if you would like to stay a part of that designation for climate smart communities. And that is the big difference. And in, in, in what way, though, I didn't get that, that it, if, if we're going to be doing the same things anyway, that is it really going to be a, a big difference by signing on as opposed to we're doing it anyway and we're not going to designate ourselves? Well, so the hot topic tonight is clean energy communities. And that, no, there's not a big difference. 
for no, climate, climate smart communities, yeah. that is a long-term continuing cost that generally gets more expensive as you stay in it longer because you're, are, you're completing the easy things or the mm -hmm. low-hanging fruit mm -hmm. at the beginning. So the, the cost adds up as you stay in longer. With that five-year essentially re-up or redesignation period, that means that every five years, there is that added workload as well as those new items that you have to complete in addition to what has already been done. Okay, so that goes back to what my question was about taking you away from something else because you'd be... And that's the long-term consideration. Okay. So with respect to clean energy, yes. um, I would be, of course, in favor of this. I think it's um, designation or not, these are things that we should be doing, not just as a town, but I think as stewards of the environment. And I see that half the county has already been designated and Penfield is not. So I think to be responsible within Monroe County, we should absolutely be working towards as many action items as the other concerns like you raised, budgetary time, staffing, et cetera. So you have my support. Great. Yeah, I mean, I don't really see where the climate energy, clean energy communities designation is, I mean, if we're already working towards it, why wouldn't we try to get the official designation, particularly if it's a one-time thing, right? right? I agree. Okay. Can I offer an analogy? We're like taking the college courses, but not getting the degree. Right, yeah. mm -hmm. We're, not getting right. We're taking all the courses and not getting the degree. Um, can I ask one question, Sarah? Oh, absolutely. Of you, so I see, so about half, uh, we're, we're one of 11 participating and 15 are designated. Of those ones that are designated, do they all have sustainable and a sustainable engineer like, as you, like yourself or a department or? This is actually the only town in the county that has a sustainability engineer, and the town actually went through the effort with um, county um, civil service civil service to create this position. So we're really the first in in in, and why wouldn't we county. want to that I guess you highlight that fine. part that we actually are, we're we want to talk, walk you know we're we're talking the talk, walk the walk, and do, and I, I agree I, with the rest of the board. I feel that mm -hmm. we probably should, we should be designated. We're doing the work on it, and yeah. especially in the grant piece, too. Getting so we want to formalize this, then, yes. is what I'm hearing mm -hmm. all everyone say. Think so. Then, um, if you feel it would be appropriate, um, we in the engineering department can put together a resolution that affirms that desire by the town board to pursue the designation for clean energy communities. Yes. I'll make that motion. Motion by Councilperson Lee and a second by second. Councilperson Cole. If there are no questions or comments, we can go right ahead with a roll call vote. Mm -hmm. Cindy. Aye. Draw. Aye. Cole. Aye. Lee. Aye. Four ayes. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. Thanks for being here. Moving on to action item D, 2132 Five Mile Line Administrative Conditional Use Permit. That would be me. Mm -hmm. um, at 2132 Five Mile Line, it's an, um, an existing building with multiple tenant spaces. Um, the current space being proposed is vacant. Um, uh, a sole proprietor dog grooming business is proposing to locate into that space. Um, the, uh, in co consultation with the town attorney, we believe this could be a, a good candidate for an administrative conditional use permit. We've done that in the past, um, or this board has done that in the past for other um, changes of occupancy that weren't going to be a, a big generator of any change in terms of the use of the property. Um, the, uh, the property is located in the Historic Preservation District. So the, any modification to the, chain, the signage, there is a freestanding sign that shows the existing tenants. The one space is currently blank, so they would have to put in um, signage uh, that is uh, commensurate with the Historic Preservation Board's Certificate of uh, Appropriateness. Excuse me, Ms. Ivers, do you have a map? I certainly oh. can, yes. I'll pull that up for you right now. Thank you. And can you say what was previous, previously there? It, I believe it was the, um, an office for a nonprofit. So it was a mul had multiple folks there. This is going to be a single proprietor 
no other employees, so, and, and the services are provided um, by appointment. Mm -hmm. And there, there's ample parking actually was on the site today. So this will give you sort of some sense of where you are. Yeah. We are south of the intersection with, oh, let me drag, I can see it, you can't see it yet. <laughs> Hold on one moment. There we are. Thank you. So you'll see um, there is um, there is the building here. There is, um, I believe the bar parking lot is, is located adjacent to it. So plenty of mm -hmm. parking availability. The site is being proposed here on the back of the building. There's the freestanding sign. Um, currently there's a blank space at the very bottom. Uh, my understanding would be that the new um, business name would be there. And the only other signage that they're proposing is a window decal um, on the window for the entrance that you'd be using to access the space. Mm -hmm. And it's clear and you almost have to look really close at the door to see it. Mm -hmm. Or if you're me, you have to get out of the car and walk up to the building to see it. Yeah. You so, said there would just be one employee? I, yeah, she's the sole proprietor. Um, and so um, again, and even with the addition, you know, the um, availability of the public parking next door, yeah. it, I, I didn't see that there'd be any issues or concerns that would warrant a public hearing for a change in business at this location. No, no. I would agree this is a good candidate for administrative review, but I just wanna make sure board's comfortable. Yes. So in, in the rest of the building, Carrie, I think, I believe, this is the Mac Shack yep. is in this building. There's a, a, a hair salon or a, a salon yes, at the front side of the building. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so everybody can get their hair done at once. And that's, yeah. I'm sorry, it's a crude joke, I apologize. I'm trying to play to the audience here. Not everybody. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, present company, I apologize. We were gonna say anything. <laughs> sure. And what we would do is as part of that um, administrative uh, conditional use would it upon um, approval by the Historic Preservation Board so that they could move forward. Sure. I think that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yep. Do you need anything formal? No, we'll point? do it administrative. I, the, there's an administrative uh, document that I prepare and that Sue is kind enough to help me uh, navigate and get to the, to the new business. So we should be all set. I think it's appropriate to indicate Make, in the minutes something about the town board uh, authorizing exercising its discretion to have this be done as an administrative mm -hmm. uh, review. Sure. Do you need a formal vote for that? Um, I, I think that's the better course of action, actually. Then we'll do that. Mm -hmm. right. <laughs> okay. May I have a motion then? I'll move that we that we allow this under administrative action for this 2132 21, for a conditional use permit for that for that dog grooming. Second. All right, motion by Councilperson Draw with a second by Councilperson Cole. And a roll call vote. Uh, so, I'm sorry, Cinti? Aye. Draw? Aye. Cole? Okay. Aye. Lee? Aye. Four ayes. Thank you. Action item E, 1129 Empire Boulevard. Mm -hmm. So I do have the applicant here um, who can come and help and present, but as we, I'll just give the background here. This is the bar bill located at 1129 Empire Boulevard. At the one of our last meetings, the board um, reviewed administratively the proposed uh, modifications to the patio and exterior um, replacement of siding. That was approved by this board. Now the sign package is back before you that corresponds or reflects the current, the current exterior of the building. Um, and so I'm happy to show that to you um, in some images right now. And bear with me while I get them ready for you. They're, they're trying to correct the issue for what's happening with the technology. That's Bear with me. I, that's what I thought. Okay. Sorry, my computer's not really cooperating with me, so we're gonna. Okay, so this is 
I'll be loading these up for you. Um, the, you'll know this is the building mounted signage that's being proposed, um, the same design on both uh, sides of the building facing east and facing west. Um, and then I'll also pull up the, um, the perpendicular sign that was originally approved or, or, or presented to the board um, has not, has, remains the same. Um, and so I'd, I'm going to show you the original. I don't know if we have one that has the, um, I apologize. I, I'm looking for the one that might have the newer. Here, we'll get you one more. So Wait. while you're looking for that, um, I know this is a continuation of the discussion we had just a couple of months ago. Um, and we did want to just see it against the new siding. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Yeah, just a, a couple quick quick points. And uh, and thank you again for, for your time. And uh, we appreciate you uh, tabling uh, this the last time uh, because Again, I apologize uh, for our lack of preparation at that at that meeting. Uh, but just a couple of quick points. Um, so according to code, as I understand it, uh, that we're able to have one pole mounted uh, sign and one building mounted sign uh, per per business. Um, a pole mounted sign really doesn't work on the property with the 35 feet setback uh, the way the uh, parking and whatnot is laid out, uh, you would not be able to see it even as you drove by. Um, also, um, we were somewhat uh, concerned. When we left the board meeting, um, we thought, well, gee, maybe we could get away with, uh, with just one sign, uh, the perpendicular sign, which we really like, and it's part of our, part of our brand. Uh, if you look at our other locations, we essentially have a pole-mounted sign. Uh, with that perpendicular sign, if you will, uh, mounted on a pole. But uh, the more that uh, we reviewed uh, the location, um, what uh, became somewhat uh, of a concern to us is at the rate that traffic comes down both hills, depending on what direction that you're going in, um, we're a little concerned that folks won't see a single sign and that uh, it would probably be most beneficial uh, to have a sign that can be seen uh, from a further distance away than having to be right on top of the building. And that might be why uh, McGregor's had previously had the large built-in mounted uh, signs. Um, I don't know if Carrie has the image of the original McGregor signs. I'm uh, doing a past upload. But the total, the total square footage of uh, the McGregor signs, they had two gable signs, and then they had on the uh, west side of the building, uh, they had a sign that was mounted on the fence. And their total square footage uh, was 144 square feet. Our total square footage, including both sides of the projecting signs, is 102 square feet. And uh, to also put that in perspective with uh, building uh, or, or town code uh, for signage, uh, the typical guide is, is two times the linear frontage square footage. Um, the linear frontage square footage is 95 feet of that building. Uh, so twice would be 190. So what we're proposing is about half that at, at 102 square feet total. So the west side square footage would be 44. Uh, the east side gable would be 21 square feet. And the projecting sign each side is 18 square feet uh, for a total of 36. Any questions? Well, I think that you answered one of my questions already because we talked about what the square footage was of McGregor's. We didn't know that. Right. Uh, so that's helpful for me. I can understand with the traffic being what it is, why you would want those gable signs. I'm not necessarily averse to that, but it does right. help to put it in perspective with McGregor's. Right. Any questions from the board? Where was the, where's the gable sign for McGregor's? Uh, she's got them up now. Yeah. So, so on both those sides. 
Uh, no, that one, that side on the other side. Yeah, they're on, the on other each side. side as well. right. Okay, I'm sorry. I didn't. Uh, no problem. I didn't. Yeah. So you want to do this is the sign you want to do right now. So we want to do the the perpendicular sign that you see right, right now, mm -hmm. and then there are two uh, gable signs. Um, they're identical, uh, one for each gable. It it looks like this. No, no, it, uh, it's the uh, one Harry's before. It's the red. It's the red one before. So it does yeah. look different. Because those are two do totally different design. I mean, uh, fonts and everything. Right. I, our thought was was something that sort of fit more uh, with the coloring scheme and 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 wasn't it didn't stick out, uh, if you will. Um, you know. So the thought was one stick out sign, and 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 uh, and others that sort of fit. You know, more with the building. And one's channel, and I noticed one said illuminated. Are you one side? Are you illuminating it? Uh, the only illumination is the 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 lettering itself are LED. So so in the evening, so they, you know, uh, there would be an illumination of the lettering. So they're lighted. The LED. The lettering, yeah. The lettering the, does have yeah. okay. Yep. And with that perpendicular sign, those are the colors you're using. Those are the colors. Yes. Okay. And that's something that's on all your buildings, I think you yes, said. It's yeah. a vintage yes, sign. Okay. Yes, exactly. And is there any other signage you're proposing? No. So just those three? That's it. Okay. Thoughts? I think it's easier to read if you don't have it in script, but <laughs> I don't Underst know. Understood. But maybe with a light, you yeah. must have. Well, that's part of your branding, though, yeah, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, right. what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I have no concerns about this. No, no. Mm -hmm. You, we're within reason. That right. They, they yeah. within the signing. And I, my understanding, past practice, the town board in this district has the ability to grant approval as part of the uh, the signage is part of the special use permit that was issued, um, and that conditional or that that special use permit. There's a condition that says, you know, any and all signage comes back to the board for final right. approval. Mm -hmm. So that's what this part of that processes is you getting to have approval for the signage mm -hmm. okay do you need that formalized at all um uh you know what why don't we, and maybe in the interest of uh consistency we can um have a vote to approve the signage as presented at this meeting because there have been mm -hmm. some various iterations and that can be reflected in the minutes there won't we don't need a separate resolution or anything along right those i was going to say because that came with the yes okay fine that was that was what i was asking yeah all right so I would I would entertain a motion to approve the signage as presented this evening. So moved. Second. Motion by Councilperson Cole and a second by Councilperson Lee. And we'll go right ahead with a roll call vote. I'm sorry, Cinti. Aye. Draw. Aye. Cole. Aye. Lee. Aye. Thank you so much for your time this evening. Thank you so much. Could I make one just quick comment to the board as well? Uh, I was a little. Uh, uh, I just wanted to second or third what the earlier uh, uh, councilman and supervisor had mentioned, and uh, how professional your team is. Uh, you know, we work with a lot of a lot of boards, and and I have to say, the town of Penfield and the employees that we've interacted here are absolutely top notch. Uh, I can't say enough mm -hmm. about about Carrie, but everybody else that we've interacted with are 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 incredibly professional and timely and. Uh, uh, they've been, you know, really great to work with. So we're really looking forward to being here. Thank you so much. It's our pleasure. Thank you. Now, you know, you just said that on public, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again, and good luck to you. Moving on with local law, cannabis retail dispensary follow-up. Again, Ms. Ivers. Hi there. Hi so there. Um, wanted to bring this back to discussion. This, The board at our last work session, we reviewed some proposed modifications to the draft local law. I know that um, there were some questions around the, um, the permitted districts where the conditional uses could be considered. Um, per the board's request, I did prepare a little bit more of an analysis of the light industrial district only as an option. And unfortunately, there are no developable parcels. Um, and so 
I, my recommendation would be to keep the general business district in as one of the available um, districts for the conditional use um, and wanted to make sure that the board was comfortable with that before we prepared the final version of the local law that would be circulated in conformance with New York State town law. Um, so you'll be receiving that in hard copy form at least 10 di business days prior to the time that you'll be eligible to vote on it, which we're targeting for the October 19th um, legislative meeting. Um, so you'll get that at least 10 days before, not including Sundays. Okay. But I wanna make sure the board's comfortable with that. Can I ask a question, Carrie? You sure so can. So on the, um, the industrial yep. use, uh, limited industri industrial, it, it, there was not enough parcels in there? There are no parcels really available when you take it into consideration the distance requirements from residential districts. And I'll mm -hmm. be honest with you, when we prepared the mapping, we omitted one of the districts that would have been, would have been counted as residential. So then it be, makes even less parcels available for development and any of the parcels that are there that potentially could be were either occupied by other buildings and other uses that are not likely a good candidate for redevelopment. You know, so there's a hotel or the parcel mm -hmm. was, parcels were uh, encumbered or the, their, the ownership or the encumbrances of EPOD uh, layers would have made them, they're essentially non, not developable. The, um, in looking at the, the diagram of the parcels for the light industrial, they're, they're, they didn't include the mobile home park which a district, which would be a um, also a residential district, mm -hmm. which is adjacent to I think I think both allies have MHPs districts right adjacent to them, so that would be something else to consider, and it would probably wipe out you know a lot more parcels. Uh, yes, I understand because that, that wasn't included in the diagram. So right. Thanks. For yeah, I did before, and I wanted to just uh, clarify that on. Um, I just wanted to ask again that on officially. Yeah. No, so we did take a second and hard mm -hmm. look. It's you know important to make sure that we're doing you know really um, sufficient analysis mm -hmm. of those types of things. Um, but as we've discussed, we want to make sure we're not exposing ourselves to action by the state. Agreed. Okay, thank you. Okay. So if the the board is amenable to moving forward with the local law. We'll prepare the final version of it. I'll work with the town attorney to make sure that it's in its final form. It will be circulated to all members of the board in compliance with New York State town law. Do you need a motion? Do you need a motion for that, to, that we're accepting the general use as the I, I, area? I think that if, um, if you want to, uh, for the purposes of the minutes, <laughs> memorialize the fact that you're okay with the current version of the draft local law um, we had that had been reviewed at the last meeting. I think this was the one last item that was subject to further discussion. And I'm looking to our esteemed attorney to make sure that I'm doing that correctly. Yeah, it, Ultimately, I mean, you're gonna be voting on a resolution with the local law. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, you, it can't hurt to, to clarify that through the resolution reflecting the minutes. And then the you know you have to have ten calendar days to have the final version before you can act on it under the municipal home rule. All right, so we're looking for um, basically a motion to prepare a resolution yes. to adopt the local law yes. for the cannabis dispensary. Mm -hmm. Would anyone like to make that motion? Sure. So, so moved. Second. Motion by Councilperson Draw with a second by Councilperson Lee. Cole, I think it's Cole. And I'm Lee. sorry. That's okay. Sec Councilperson Cole with a second by Councilperson Lee. All right, roll call vote. Senti. Aye. Draw. Aye. Cole. Aye. Lee. Aye. Four ayes. All right, action item G, 1854 Penfield Road, conditional use permit and site plan approval for Daniel Roofing. So this is an application. Um, I'm requesting the town board's um, permission to prepare a resolution uh, to set a public hearing associated with the conditional use permit that's required. Um, the property is under new ownership. Um, the, the applicant is the owner of the building and does have a roofing business. Um, the town, uh, the town was alerted to some conditions through code enforcement. Um, 
that were being addressed and in the process we determined that the ownership had changed of the building and there were not the approvals, the town board approvals in place mm -hmm. required for him to be open in operation, or operating his business from that location. So we did communicate with the owner of the property, advised him of the need to come in and make application to the town board. Um, and now that application has been received, it is deemed complete. So I feel comfortable asking the town board to accept the application and to move forward with setting a public hearing. As part of the conditional use, the applicant is interested in um, building a shed on the back side of the property, um, which would assist with any storage of materials that might be associated with the business. And certainly as the um, application is reviewed in the public hearing, once the public hearing is conducted, I think there's probably an opportunity for some additional conversation around how the site's operated to ensure that it's in keeping with the four corners. Um, and I think the board has received, um, uh, co uh, they have already received uh, inquiries or a complaint regarding mm -hmm. the condition of the property. Code enforcement is actively monitoring it. There was a court date scheduled um, the, to address the, the, uh, the code enforcement issues. Part of compliance is coming to this town board. So that's moving him toward compliance by making the application. Okay, so I just want to state for the record that all we're doing is establishing a public hearing. Resolution establishing a public hearing. Fine, um, but there's no decision made, obviously, mm -hmm. and that doesn't that that Correct. is just the step before the, uh, any kind of consideration of a conditional use permit. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Just the public hearing. So we have a complete application that allows me to ask you to set the public hearing. I'll make that motion. May I have a second. Second. All right. Motion by Councilperson Lee with a second by Councilperson Cole. Can I ask one question? Yes, of course. Yes, thanks, Supervisor. Sorry. Um, that's okay. One question, Carrie. Um, currently, right now, is the applicant operating out of that building? A business? The, the, a, a, a business out it's of that building? It's my understanding that, yes, the, the applicant owns the building, mm -hmm. also owns a, a, a roofing business. Mm -hmm. Um, if I, so I believe he is operating out of that location currently. And he can do that before the public hearing? Well, this is one of those uh, chicken and egg issues. Mm -hmm. um, so sometimes folks come into town, they don't know what the requirements are, um, you know, before they can open their doors. Um, so we certainly, I can work with the town attorney um, who is, you know, we can determine what the proper protocol is. Um, I guess I only ask that because, you know, we have an aw awful lot of people and businesses there as here tonight that come into this town to us prop and under proper procedures and go through public hearings and wait and, you know, till they get their parking lots, until they get, you know, things approved. Um, and, you know, I don't, I think that that's something that, you know, I consider that we, what we do for one, one business, I want to make sure we're being, you know, we're being fair to the others as well, so. Absolutely, I, I do know that the matter's being addressed in town court as, as well. I don't know okay. how it, things are gonna go in that direction. Once they get referred to town court, they're sort of out of our hands um, from an enforcement standpoint. Um, would wanna, I, I think I would defer to the uh, town attorney about what our abilities are when it comes to having him not operate out of that location. Well, technically he's not permitted to operate out of that location right. until uh, he gets the required approvals. So, um, okay. What has past practice been? So I, I don't know what the past practice has been for this board. Um, I think from time to time when applications have come, there probably have been, I guess I'd have to, t I'd have to talk to Andy Savegas to see if there have been kind of conditional use permits that have gone before the zoning board where somebody has already been operating. It's, it's different than a shed. I mean, like sometimes people put a shed in right. and then they don't realize that it's not you know, they're supposed to get a permit and that's in the setback until after they go to sell and, you know, they can come before the board and the, we don't make them remove it before they come in. But this is a little different because it's a different use than, you know, was there before. Let me ask the question this way then. So um, if code enforcement finds that somebody's operating without a permit, do they automatically shut them down or do they actually try to just 
bring them into compliance. Okay, so the usual course in the town of Penfield has been to try to get compliance. Okay. Right. Did that address your question? I think so. I think, yeah. So that's I think, what we're doing. Yeah. I think what we're trying to do, yeah. Okay. I yeah. just want to make it, you know, on the record, too, that, I, yeah. you know, I think that we need to be fair and consistent throughout all how we practice. And well, and I think this is one of those occasions where it's an opportunity to educate people that mm -hmm. if, you, before you open any business, um, <clears throat> you need to come and obtain the necessary approvals. Um, I think new business owners don't right. always know that, and they don't know what's required. So this is a great opportunity to educate everyone watching, you know, and certainly it'll be captured in the uh, mo forever memorialized in the in the video. But when you're coming opening a new business, check with the town or the municipality where you're located, so you know what review and approvals are needed before you start business. Mm -hmm. So the way that you know, just to follow up on that, so the penalties. <clears throat> You know, the, if somebody's operating um, or something in violation of the zoning code, in this case, operating a business without a conditional use permit, there's options that the town has to pursue. Um, they could sue the person, get an injunction to stop them from operating, but they can also pursue in um, Penfield Town Court, and really it's like a criminal matter, and they're facing fines for um, really engaging in... in um, violation of the of our town code so and that's, and, and that's what was happening here is uh, the code enforcement was pursuing a uh, code violation proceeding in Penfield Town Court and the code violations were related a, a few different things but one of the issues was also the failure to comply with the requirement to get the conditional use permit through the town um, when we first learned about the business we sent a, a, a letter indicating what the requirements were um, I second, sent a, delivered a second notice that had um, more formalized references to the requirement and officially started the 30-day clock to make sure that they knew that there was a time period and it wasn't at their leisure. Um, and then at that point, when the 30 days were done, code enforcement set notification and a court summons was issued. Um, so that's really what's prompting compliance is we did take the matter to court to make sure that the property owner knew that code enforcement and code compliance is really taken seriously here. Okay, great. All right. Thank, thanks for that response. Thank you yeah. for the follow-up. Okay, if I wrote this down correctly then, I have a motion to set a public hearing by Councilperson Lee and a second by Councilperson Cole. Yes. And may we have a roll call vote. Um, Cinti. Aye. Draw. Aye. Cole. Aye. Lee. Aye. Four eyes. Request for a hold harmless agreement at 12 Stone Hollow Drive. Mr. Valentine, thank you for sitting so patiently. Thank you. Um, so this was uh, one that was actually before the board um, earlier this summer. Um, they'd come in uh, requesting to put um, a shed in an easement um, that's owned by the town. Um, so we had a storm sewer easement. We had concerns about the shed being on top of the pipe uh, in that area. Uh, Ms. Carey's pulling it up, so it's on the lower end of the property. They're showing the shed um, it, toward the back of the easement. Initially, they came in and meeting <coughs> the required 10-foot rear setback um, would have put them very close to being over top of our pipe, which is in the middle of that, that easement area. At that time, the board said, um, have them go to the zoning board, see if the zoning board would be willing to grant a variance to move it closer to the back or relocate it somewhere further into their property, um, closer to their pool, outside of the easement altogether. So subsequent to, to that meeting, it was tabled. Um, they did go to the zoning board. They did receive a four-foot rear setback, so that now they're able to slide the shed back approximately where they're showing it. Um, the shed would still be a portion in the easement, so that's the necessity for the whole harmless agreement, um, but it would not be over top of our pipe, which is inside of that easement. So it's now back before the board tonight, um, as whether well the board is willing to grant that hold harmless agreement to allow a portion of the shed to be in our easement. Um, hold harmless agreement understanding that if and when we ever had to dig the pipe up, if there was a need to move the shed, either we'd move the shed or have the, the homeowner move the shed, you know, at their cost. Um, thank you very much. Um, actually, I think this is a fairly straightforward mm -hmm. manner, and we did take it up just recently. So are there any other questions from board members? No. Oh, okay. okay. So we can just go ahead and um, 
have a motion to prepare a resolution to approve a hold harmless agreement. Yep, so we prepare the resolution um, for next week and then subsequent to that, I'd prepare the hold harmless agreement, um, get with Mr. Dieter here to have him, uh, many other people on the deed um, sign the hold harmless agreement and then once the board passes the resolution, then that would authorize the supervisor to then sign the agreement and then get the funds to, to file it with the county clerk's office. And I, I, would, I know that our, our attorney probably has looked at this as well, is, is comfortable. Well, you'll I mean, this look was, at it when it's developed. Yeah. When it's developed. I think these are pretty standard yep. documents yeah. that have already been vetted yep. I just over the years. To, as long as you're here, good. Very well. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll make a motion that we, um, that we move ahead with that and for a, home harmless, home, a hold harmless agreement at 12 Stone Howell Drive for a shed. I'll second that. Motion by Councilperson Drawn, a second by Councilperson Lee. Uh, may we have a roll call vote? Santee. Aye. Draw. Aye. Cole. Aye. Lee. Aye. All aye. Thank you so much for waiting. Um, but we're all set, and uh, that'll be prepared for the next legislative meeting. I'll, I'll follow up with you. Thanks. Yep. Thank you. Okay, moving on to action item J, Shadow Pines Development Seeker Determination. So this is a follow-up as well. So as the board has been looking at um, the development of that northeast corner on Shadow Pines, um, we had to make a determination this board um, put forth to be lead agent um, it was a month or more ago. Um, subsequent to that, we sent off the necessary letters to the other involved in, in uh, affected agencies. They wrote back, um, had no issue with this board <coughs> being lead agent for that application. Um, so from that, we've then prepared uh, for your consideration part one, two, and three. Um, those were in your uh, drop materials to take a look at. Um, so it was a, um, we did initially determine it to be a type one action um, based on the size of the development impact to you know, parkland areas. Um, but after going through the determination, looking at um, you know, the items in there, um, the traffic levels are lower than what was originally for a golf course. Um, we looked at you know, the other impacts and you know, the buffering of the distance to the other properties. Um, we have shown that um, we would determine it to be um, a negative declaration as part of that and just want to make sure the board, the board is, um, confirms that and the board is uh, okay with that determination. All right, so this is a type one with a negative declaration? Correct. And then we would just want to... Um, so just be a vote of the board to authorize the... The resolution the, for the a resolution to be signed. So I don't know if we need a resolution. I think it would just be authorizing you to sign the, the secret documentation. I, I'm so used to Zoning Board of Appeals, so I'm used to it in the resolution. Okay. So I mean, we can see. do it either way. I've done it with well, yeah, this is, it up the council. The way Mark describes it is, is a good way to do it. So I think as long as you take a vote to authorize um, the supervisor to sign it, um, okay. you'll sign the, the secret documentation. We'll you know, uh, complete sure. that and wrap that up. No problem. And file it with the, and yes. file with the ENB. Yes, it's part of a type one action. DEC. Sure. The secret documentation confirms that it's, that you're, it's a neg, neg deck too. I mean, okay. that's what it's. Mm -hmm. All right, so then I'm looking for a motion to authorize the supervisor to sign for the secret determination for Shadow Pines, uh, granting a type one with a neg deck um, determination. So moved. I'll second that. We have a motion by Councilperson Cole with a second by Councilperson Lee. Are there any questions of Mr. Valentine? Okay. I'm sorry for that confusion. I'm just so used to doing it within certain, mm. having the resolution that night. Okay. Sorry about that. No, no, no one needs to apologize. Okay. And a roll call vote. Santee. Aye. Draw. Aye. Cole. Aye. Lee. Aye. All aye. Thanks, Mark. Sure. And moving on to the Shadow Pines bidding and construction contract. So um, as a follow-up to um, where we've um, been, so the BME Associates, um, this board has hired them to do the initial design. Um, they've designed the layout. Um, this board has approved the layout of the parking lot, um, where the, the driveway entrances are, the pickleball courts, the bathroom. Um, we've gone through the, you know, the ARPA funds is, is authorizing ARPA funds towards that. Um, so BME going through the contract we have up to date has made application or submission to the other agencies. So approvals from the Water Authority, uh, Health Department, 
um, DOT and um, uh, it was County DOT Health Department, uh, Water Authority, and uh, Department, Department of Environmental Services for the Sanitary Sewer Connection. So they've made all those applications and submittals. We're starting to get some of those back in. So that's completed where BME's contract took us to date. So now we've got the new contract um, that was before the board was to go into um, final construction details and then put it out to bid um, so that um, as they complete those and get it out to bid, you know, hopefully we can get out to bid, you know, later this year um, and then into construction next year to get started. So uh, due to the size of the contract um, and those elements, that's why it's before the board tonight to, so that when we do need resolution, yes. if the board wants to uh, proceed with that, um, then that resolution would authorize the supervisor to sign that contract and get that uh, and going I believe into the next phase. Mr. Weiser has reviewed this as well, correct? Uh, yes, I think you sent that to me today, the BME contract, yes. Okay, great, thank you. Are there any questions by the board members? It's nice to see this moving yeah. along. Yeah, we've had, been waiting for this. Yeah. yeah. I'll make a motion that we move ahead and, and we accept this uh, um, for the, the bidding con uh, construction um, contract for a resolution for next, maybe the next legislative meeting. Yep. Second. Okay. I have a motion by Councilperson Draw with a second by Councilperson Cole to prepare a resolution authorizing the supervisor to sign a, the bidding and construction contract for Shadow Pines. And if there are no questions or comments, we can have a roll call vote. Cinti. Aye. Draw. Aye. Cole. Aye. Lee. Aye. Four eyes. A request for a hold harmless agreement at 8 Sunleaf Drive. Um. So as uh, Carrie's pulling it up and put it on your screen, um, so we, Sunleaf Drive, we've been contacted by Mr. Nursinger. Um, he would like to install a fence in his backyard. Um, he recently acquired this property. Um, so he has two frontages. So his house faces Sunleaf Drive, as well as his backyard is Five Mile Line Road. Um, so he's looking to put a fence in his backyard. Um, there are a few easements back there. Um, one is with rg &E. he's working on that. Um, another is our sidewalk easement. So he actually wants to put the fence 10 feet off the rear property line, which would put it in the middle of our sidewalk easement. What we've already started, and if that was normally the case, we'd have more pause. But since we've done survey earlier this year, the board said we wanted to look at doing sidewalks on five mile, um, going from Shoecraft down to the park. We've had survey done, we're looking at it. It makes more sense due to all the other um, utilities. Um, landscaping stuff out there to put it closer to the road. So we'd likely be in the back side of the right of way. Um, so we'd actually not use our sidewalk easement. Um, in this case, I wouldn't want to abandon it though either. Um, so if somewhere down the road long beyond our time, uh, the county decides to widen five mile line road, we'd still have that easement in place. So I'd like to, um, our recommendation is to keep the easement. Um, but I don't think with our sidewalk in it, if he wants to locate his fence in it, um, you know, through a hold harmless agreement, if and when the road was widened, if and when we wanted to use that easement sometime in the future, we could relocate his fence or move his fence out of it at his cost to replace the fence in there. So that was kind of a long-winded way to say, I don't think we're gonna need it, um, need our sidewalk easement, we'll be in the right of way. Um, but since it is the easement yeah. and I don't propose that we abandon the easement, he would have to get a hold harmless agreement to locate right. the fence within that You area. recommend them? Yes. yes. Are there any questions for Mr. Valentine? No, I move that we get a resolution to accept this request for the hold harmless agreement at 8 Sunleaf Drive. Second. I have a motion by Councilperson Cole with a second by Councilperson Draw uh, to prepare a resolution mm -hmm. um, to have the supervisor sign a hold harmless agreement at 8 Sunleaf Drive. And if there are no questions, we will have a roll call vote. Cinti. Aye. Draw. Aye. Cole. Aye. Lee. Aye. Four eyes. Okay. Uh, the next item, and uh, I do want to just, uh, just to, to, we won't have an executive session, but we do have one item of new business um, this evening that um, Ms. Ivers did send to the board. Um, but action item L, Emily Palumbo's grant service. Um, 
at this point in time, there's an incredible amount of monies that are coming from the federal government um, regarding infrastructure related to um, infrastructure projects with the bill that was, was passed. Um, and it's kind of an unprecedented time, actually, to, to have these opportunities available. And what um, Barbara Chertow and Carrie and Ivers and I were talking about was, you know, how do we make sure that we are taking advantage of every opportunity that's presented to us, helping um, what's the best way to sort through all these opportunities to make sure that we are using our time and our resources wisely for applications. And we met with Emily Palumbos, who used to be with MRB um, and is now um, uh, owner of her own company um, to find out exactly how she might be able to work with us to, to help us. And the nice thing about Emily is that she not only helps with grant s searches, but also grant writing and grant administration, which is um, a nice thing to have yeah. because part of the issue for towns is that they don't have the staff to not only pursue the grants, but to write and administer them and deal with the paperwork associated with it. So um, Emily uh, proposed that um, she do an initial assessment to see what grants we were able to um, be eligible for that would be good investment of our time and resources to write. And um, an initial contract was presented just to do that assessment uh, for a total of $4,000. Um, I did ask the board at one point if they wanted Emily to be here, um, but I, I didn't think that I saw that you needed that. Um, Emily, I just asked her about her background at MRB, and she was, you know, started out f uh, and, you know, earning, bringing in about $60,000 in grants from her clients and ended up with her last year, she had procured over $50 million for all her clients at MRB in total. So no promises, certainly, but she is very experienced and knows her job. So I would like to uh, get permission from the board to enter into a contract for an initial assessment with uh, Emily Palumbos Consulting. So moved. In. Where would the funds be drawn from? Um, these are not ARPA funds. These would just be drawn from our the general general account. right general account. And um, is there any idea of what the work product would amount to? In terms of, based on her experience, does she think that there would be at least you know two to three? grants that she may be able to assist on during the contract year? Yes, and probably more. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, um, so if, if you look at the contract I sent, it would be, you know, she's basically reviewing all of our documents, meeting with town staff, um, and then based on her skill set, knowing what's out there, developing a whole list of our opportunities. Mm -hmm. Hey, Carrie, do you want to add anything? I was going to jump in and just offer up that um, I think working from the town's identified priorities through the CIP, the capital improvement program that the, the town has, other priority projects that have been identified, um, she'd be exploring, and, and any other things that come up through her conversations with staff, she would be identifying state, federal, regional grant opportunities and looking at ways to capitalize on portions of projects that could be funded through various, so identifying multiple funding opportunities that could help achieve you know, one more, many of the town's goals. Mm -hmm. So it's not seeking one grant opportunity, it's sort of developing a menu of grant opportunities that the town could pursue. And I think just as important as identifying the ones that the town should pursue, it's also identifying the ones that might not be worth our effort or time in pursuing. Uh, grant, some grant solicitations are, you know, highly involved, require a lot of data, you know, collection, and are time consuming, consuming to prepare. So if there's a, no chance that the town would be successful, it's good to focus your energy and time on the things that you feel like are a better fit. Right. 
do we have a, a, a sense of how long that this contract would go with her? Well, it goes through December, so. Yeah, just right. goes through December. And then, right, but and this is just the assessment. Right, just the assessment. And then to do the grants would be an additional contract. That an you'd additional. be looking at, right, but we could at least evaluate that. Right, so we have to write. Again, so moved. I'll second Sounds that. Good. I think it is. But I think you have a oh, question. I, so I, um, yeah. I just have a question. I, I, um, all right. Um, so she's asking for $2,000 up front without any uh, work yet completed, which is fine. That's her contract provision. The scope of services, are we confident that she would be able to complete by the term of the contract because it expires. There's no other sunset clause or anything that protects the town should there be a delay on her part. And then we are out the $2,000 without any work product. So that's why I was asking what is tied to the upfront payment, like nothing, right? Well, I don't think she would even need this much time <coughs> to do it. Um, okay, I mean, if we're confident that she can complete it within that time, but I, I, you know, just, my hesitation is there doesn't appear to be anything tied in terms of work product for the first installment of payment. So, Mr. Weiser, would you think we should consider any different wording? Um, I, you know, that's, it raises a good point. I mean, I don't. I didn't print. I did. I looked at it earlier. Oh, today, here. I didn't, I didn't I have print an extra it. Copy. I didn't print it out. Um, the, I mean, she'd be in breach of contract, I think, if she didn't um, produce anything, but I think it's, it's, it wouldn't be, I don't want to delay the process too much, but I think, you know, you, we probably could, would she be amenable to adding a, some, a clause in there about the, you know, Failure to provide yeah, work product would, would, would mean, result in a. She's not going to enter into this contract if she's not going to produce the uh, the service. But um, yeah, and if the summary is, I mean, you, you could we could ask her to add, you know, language in here along the lines of, um, you know, two thousand. Do immediately with 2,000 due upon summary submission. If there is no summary submission, you know the all you know any amounts paid should be refunded to the town. Something like that, right? I mean, um, it's a pretty basic contract. It's just she's just going to do, you know, put put together, you know, do her analysis and and come up with her summary submission. So I think, I mean, it seems like in all likelihood she's going to deliver. And if she doesn't deliver, then you're either going to keep working with her until she delivers, and then you're going to pay her the four thousand. I mean, even though it says you know it's going to expire on the at the end of the year, she's going to want to keep. She's going to want to continue the work, get paid, and then hopefully get the subsequent work. So, um, right. you know, if we want to ask her about that, to, you know, to protect the town, but at the end of the day, I think practically speaking, she's going to. You know, you you could sue her for the ten, two thousand dollars, but she's gonna she's gonna want to complete the contract. You know, because she's gonna has a chance to do get the more you know, the grant writing work. Okay. So, um, I can certainly bring this back to the town board with her, with new language in it, um, or we can look to approve this with language approved by the by the town attorney to, to expedite it you mean to say um, uh, proceed with the contract subject to an amendment proposed by the town attorney yeah right I mean right. I, I hesitate to wait until October right. 12th right so I would like to move forward but I'm it sounds fair fine with whatever yeah. is that okay I, I'm fine so long. I think uh, Mr. Weishar clearly understands my, yep. my concerns. So as long as there's some protection for the town. Um, yeah, I mean, I generally, uh, I, I don't like contracts when I represent my municipal clients that has like a down payment like that. But sometimes, yeah, it's, sometimes it's unavoidable. 
I am not in favor of the down payment yeah. at all, and there and I don't see a breach of contract provision tied with the first installment. Yeah. So, so long as that concern can be addressed um, to protect, and it's not it's not like it's a million dollars, but I still think the town's interest should prevail. So, with that, I'm fine to move forward. Okay, we can I can get something to Marie tomorrow. That's fine. Okay. So, go ahead. Motion. So you, Linda, made a motion. Yeah. Moved ahead. That we move ahead. Yeah. Was with the, the uh, chain upon the, additional the language, the mm -hmm. additional information about mm -hmm. language provided by the town attorney. I'll yeah. Second. I'll second it then. Yes. I have a motion by Councilperson Cole. The second by Councilperson Draw. And um, roll call vote. Cinti. Aye. Draw. Aye. Cole. Aye. Lee. Aye. Four eyes. Okay, we did have one item of new business that does conclude our action items for the evening. Um, Ms. Ivers, did you want to present that? Yes, thank you. I do apologize. Um, as you will recall, um, at the last legislative meeting, there was a public hearing associated with the proposed improvements to K2 Brothers Brewing located at 1221 Empire Boulevard. Um, during that public hearing, um, the supervisor did indicate that we'd be following up at this meeting to continue the conversation. Um, and the draft version of the agenda, we shifted a lot of things around and uh, cut and uh, paste turned into just cut, so I do apologize. Um, and because the agenda was so lengthy, it uh, didn't jump out to us that it was missing from the final version. So I apologize for that unintended omission, um, and I'm happy to report it to the, all the world on the television right now, but um, I did want to follow up. Um, uh, I think at the public hearing, we talked about the fact that there was some public comment received from a neighbor in a adjacent community related to noise. Um, we had checked with uh, our own code enforcement at bef before that public yeah. hearing and mm -hmm. verified there was only one complaint and it, again, was not substantiated at the time. I took the measure and didn't receive the comment just until uh, after our, the public hearing, but I also did check with Monroe County Sheriff's Office since 911 calls would go through them and they have the ability to research and they indicated that in the last, as long as I, back as they've checked, there were no reports of noise complaints associated with this property. So just wanted to share that piece of information for the board's knowledge. Um, uh, the applicant has been working with um, the engineering department to address PRC comments. There are um, some final technical issues that will be worked out between the town engineer um, and the applicant related to the site plan and stormwater um, design associated with it. And so that's still in progress. But as this board has done in the past, there's always a condition for, um, there's always conditions related to meeting PRC comments and getting the town engineer's final approval before final plans can be signed by the supervisor and town staff that sign. So I think with that, I just wanted to see where the board was and if you wanted me to prepare a resolution to approve the revised site plan and conditional use permit for the associated with the project. I, I thought it was very well put together The and uh, the information we had, it was, uh... It looks an exciting project, and um, you know, with your conditions as you related, I would certainly feel comfortable moving ahead with a resolution to support it for next week. And I think, as we discussed in the past, um, there have been a series of past approvals mm -hmm. granted to the property that would carry forward. Yes. We'll memorialize that in this most current version um, and reference the past resolution so that there's no mistake about what the requirements are and what's allowed. Um, do you want to put that up on? I don't want to put you on the spot. You don't have anything to put up on the screen. Do you, do you want, want me to put, to put the, the the proposed rendering? Proposed? Would you? Uh, happy to Again, do that. Thank you. Bear with me for a moment. Didn't we approve it at the last session? That I was thought... another. They had three things. No, that was <laughs> that was so the last I apologize. Yeah, lots of moving parts here. So the yeah. uh, the park the ancillary <clears throat> parking lot was approved yes. um, right. in final form. That's already gotten their approval. That was forty one Woodhaven. At last uh, legislative session, the public hearing for the improvements to 1221 for K2 were reviewed. Itself. And so before okay, so we, we can, okay. before they can move forward yep, yep. and on to the 
uh, building department right. with their final construction drawings, they need the town board's approval on the revised conditional use permit and the revised site plan associated with those improvements. Right. Yes. Yep. Okay. And I'm bringing that up for you right now. Oh, here we are. Thank you. Thank God, Marks. I have to start bringing readers to the meeting. I apologize. <laughs> And here we are. Yeah, yep. good, very good. So you'll see um, the, this is the upper deck. There's a lower um, uh, enclosed patio space. The roof line, this is the existing building that's being refaced with new material. There is going to, is going to be a modification to the roof line to accommodate um, a higher internal interior ceiling height to make it more comfortable for that uh, gathering space. And here are a few more views so you can see what the view from Empire would look like. Um, I will share with you also that the plans, the site plans that were prepared are under review by our landscape consultant and that would be another condition that the, that the landscape uh, plan is updated or modified to meet the landscape consultants um, identified you know, changes or suggestions. Mm -hmm. That would be part of the engineering department's final um, authorization. And so this is sort of it from a, mm -hmm. a distance. And here's the proposed floor plans as well. And then obviously once beyond this board, final construction plans would be reviewed in detail by both the building department and the fire marshal's office to make sure that they um, uh, adhere to all applicable New York State Uniform Code requirements for the renovation. Okay, any other questions? of Kerry. All right. Um, well, then I would entertain a motion to prepare a resolution to approve the site plans if everyone is moving towards approval. I shall make a motion that we approve these site plans. I am very happy to be able to say that. Hmm. Yeah, I think Second. that it's a nice, nice addition. Okay, that's a motion by Councilperson Draw with a second by Councilperson Cole. And we'll go for a roll call vote. Cinti. Aye. Draw. Aye. Cole. Aye. Lee. Aye. Four ayes. All right, that concludes our new business. Our next work session meeting is October 12th, 2022. And I will declare this meeting adjourned at 8.41 p.m. Thank you very much to uh, Sue and Pete and to our folks at PCTV downstairs.